It must be one of the most amazing flying stories of all time. An airliner full of passengers, out of control at 17,000 feet. And the pilot is stuck outside the plane. In the cockpit, three frightened flight attendants are clinging to his legs. If he slips from their grasp, the captain's body could be sucked into the engine and bring down the plane. At the controls, a young co-pilot is battling to get the plane to the nearest airport. For the crew of the British Airways flight from Birmingham, England to Malaga, Spain, the 10th of June began like any other day. Yeah, but I'm not doing it. Stewards Nigel Ogden and Simon Rogers, along with stewardess Sue Prince, had worked together on and off for years. <laughs> At Birmingham, um, all the cabin crew and all the pilots, they all knew each other, we were all on first name terms. The one new member of the group was Alistair Acheson. An experienced co-pilot, he'd just driven down from Manchester that morning. Come on in. Tim Lancaster is captain. He's been a commercial pilot for 21 years. Well, we better get started, eh? Before takeoff, the co-pilot performs a walk around, checking the outside of the aircraft for anything wrong. In the cockpit, Captain Tim Lancaster reviews a log of the maintenance carried out on the plane the day before. Everything okay? Fine. She's just come out of maintenance by the look of it. Nothing much there. Just change the windscreen. Many of the passengers know the flight well and are looking forward to a relaxed trip to Spain. These unsuspecting passengers and crew were about to begin an adventure of a lifetime. You seem to have made yourself comfortable. Too right. <laughs> Birmingham Tower, Speedbird 5390, we're ready to start and push. Speedbird 5390, clear to start and push. The BAC-111 was known as the Jeep of the Skies, a workhorse that was easy to maintain and had a good safety record. At 43 tonnes, this pressurised hull is carrying 81 passengers and 6 crew and is now climbing to 23,000 feet. In just over two hours, they should be in Spain. Only a catastrophic accident could bring this plane out of the skies. Two minutes into the climb, the pilots switch on the autopilot. Tim Lancaster takes off his shoulder straps and relaxes into the flight. Now I went into the flight deck to ask uh, Tim and Alistair what they would like to drink. You gentlemen, like a tea? Please, the usual. Milk, one sugar, please. And I said, your breakfast, Tom. It'll only be a few minutes. Now, almost 30 minutes after takeoff, and at 17,300 feet, they're just 5,000 feet from their assigned altitude. But then, in a split second, everything changes. With a huge explosion, the captain's windscreen blows out into the sky. Almost immediately, a white fog forms. I saw a really intense stomach, body shaking thud. We were just diving, really. And then we started to judder like this. And I, I was a bit stunned. I, didn't, I thought, well, I thought, oh God, it's a bomb. Alistair, the co-pilot, is suddenly fighting for control in a 350-mile-an-hour wind. There's no time to think about the captain. 
who's been blasted out of the window by pressurized air escaping from the aircraft. The rushing wind pins Captain Lancaster to the roof of the cockpit. Inside, his legs have jammed the control column forward, disconnecting the autopilot and pushing the plane down into a dive. Co-pilot Alistair Atchison has to take command. While he fights to bring the plane under control, steward Nigel Ogden can see his captain is being sucked out of the aircraft. And I looked in, the flight deck door was resting on the controls and all I could see was Tim out the window. I jumped over, put one foot in the uh, captain's footwell, and the other one was down the side of his seat. I just grabbed him before he went out completely. Nigel Ogden holds on to the captain for dear life. Outside, a 390 mile an hour blast of wind at minus 17 degrees centigrade smashes into Tim Lancaster's body. The tornado in the cockpit is giving Atchison major problems. Air traffic control can hear his cries for help, but the storm rushing through the cockpit drowns out their replies. The captain's feet are still pushing against the control column, and Alistair is struggling to get full control of the plane. He's now diving through some of the busiest air lanes in the world, with the added danger of a mid-air collision. From the cabin, lead steward John Heward sees the chaos in the cockpit and does what he can to help. I looked up, and there was Nigel sort of hanging across the seat in the flight deck. In front of me, the flight deck door had fallen forwards and trapped itself between the actual door frame and the throttles of the aircraft. So I literally stamped on it twice and it literally broke into three or four pieces. Behind, on the wall of the flight deck, there is a spare seat for anybody to observe the flight or whatever. And I thought, well, if I put my arm through the seat belt there, I can grab both of them and at least we've got some sort of anchor point inside the aircraft. Alistair, who's never flown with this crew before, has to leave them to their own devices and focus on getting the plane to safety. He now has control of the throttles. John and Nigel have wrenched the captain's feet away from the control column. But instead of slowing down, Hatchison decides to continue the rapid descent. It will quickly take him out of the way of any other air traffic and take him to a lower altitude where oxygen equipment won't be needed. Staying too long at a high altitude risks oxygen starvation and this older aircraft is not fully equipped with oxygen for all the passengers on board. The airspeed indicator goes into the red. dived to 11,000 feet in just two and a half minutes. But as they level out and slow down to 170 miles per hour, the captain's body is no longer pinned to the roof and slides round to the side of the plane. Working his way from the back of the cabin, steward Simon Rogers now catches sight of the chaos in the cockpit for the first time. Now the aircraft had got to sort of fly in fairly level, Simon came up from the back. Nigel was beginning to get really sort of achy now with his arms and I knew he wasn't going to let go unless he was sure that Tim wouldn't fly out of the window. We all had fear in our eyes, we were all worried sick because we thought, you know, either Tim's going to die or we're going to die, you know. That was going through my mind. But it was up to Alistair then, and it was up to us three, Simon and John and myself, to hold on to grim death. All I remember is Tim's arms flailing out. 
His arms seemed about six foot long. And he's, I'll never forget that. His eyes were wide open. I mean, his face was hitting the side of the side screen. But he didn't blink. And I, I, I thought to myself, and I said to John, I said, I, I think he's dead. I think he's dead. And I said, you and Sy will have to hold on. I can't hold on anymore. I can't hold on anymore. I've lost the feeling in my arms. And he decided to put Simon. I said to Simon, you sit in that jump seat and fasten yourself in. With, with Simon sitting in the seat, we'd freed Tim's legs from between the control column and the seat. So we hooked his feet over the back of the captain's seat and then Simon literally put his hands on the top to say he was holding his ankles down. Simon and Alistair now face one of their most difficult decisions. What to do with the lifeless body of the captain. No words are said, but for a moment the thought passes between them that the best thing would simply be to let it go. No! Can you hold on to it, please? But Alistair's order isn't simply an act of compassion. Releasing the body at the position it was in, it would have gone close to the upper area of the wing. It could have damaged the leading edge of the wing. Had it gone over the wing, it could very well have gone into the engine. Quite a lot of damage could have been caused by the release of the body. So I think it was a very sensible decision to try and keep him where he was. Alistair has managed to get down to 11,000 feet. Without the captain to help, he's operating the plane's systems from memory and shepherding it around Heathrow. Some of the most congested airspace in the world. Seven minutes out of contact with the ground, he's able to hear the voice of air traffic control for the first time. Requesting radar assistance onto the nearest airfield, please. Speedbird 5390, roger. Can you accept landing at Southampton? Speedbird 5390, I am familiar with Gatwick. Would appreciate Gatwick. Alistair wants to land at Gatwick Airport, as he's flown there many times before. But Southampton is nearer, and even though he's never flown there before, he knows he has to get down fast. And I am on 150 knots. Requesting radar assistance into Southampton. When you're going to an airport that you're not used to, you normally have uh, charts, let down plates, uh, uh, that kind of thing that you can uh, read up on and uh, um, learn something of the airport you're going to. Um, but he knew nothing of Southampton. He hadn't been there. He had no charts because everything had gone out the window. There was no let down plates to look at the approach and so on. All the maps and charts blew out of the window with the captain, and only the air traffic controller can guide Atchison. He turns towards Southampton. Southampton, this is Speedbird 5390, do you read? Speedbird 5390, good morning. Identified on handover from London radar, six miles west of Southampton airfield. What is your passing level? Uh, Roger, sir, I am not familiar with uh, Southampton request. Do you shepherd me onto the runway? When he, when he spoke, he was um, obviously stressed. It sounded uh, as if he was under, under a fair bit of pressure. What is your number of persons on board? Uh, we have uh, 84 passengers on board. Uh, and I think that will be all until we are on the ground. Uh, Roger, that's copied. Um, I've been advised it's pressurisation failure. Is that the only problem? Uh, negative. Uh... The... Uh... Captain is uh, half out of the aeroplane, I understand. I believe he's dead. Roger, that is copied. My feeling was when he told me what was going on, it was um, one of disbelief because it doesn't actually happen. You know, it's one of these things that you see in films that happens in films, but it doesn't happen in real life. And uh, it was sort of the, the hairs in the back of the neck go up and there's this feeling down the spine, the tingle down the spine, and you think, no, it's not for real, but it's got to be. Uh, flight attendant holding on to him, but uh, request an emergency facility for the captain. I think he is dead. Affirm, 
What is your passing level? Uh, leaving flight level uh, 5,500 feet on uh, 1019. Roger, that's copied. I'll uh, give you a little bit more space, then I'll turn you on to a heading of 180. Yeah, it's a full emergency. It's a one Rundle contacts the emergency area. services at the first I opportunity. I'm on board, but I'll let you know. Could you confirm that the uh, level of runway at Southampton is uh, acceptable for a 111? Yes, it is acceptable for a 111, and I'll give you the figures shortly. As long as we have at least uh, two and a half thousand metres, I am happy. I'm afraid we don't have two and a half thousand metres. Neither do Bournemouth. We have a maximum of 1,800 metres. Atchison is concerned that the plane is above its maximum landing weight, being full of fuel for the journey to Malaga. And the BAC-111 can't dump fuel. If the runway isn't long enough, he faces more problems. Whether the aircraft could actually stop on the runway, or whether the tires would burst, or whether he would go off, uh, go off the end of the runway. Uh, that's obviously what he was worried about when asking for um, 2,200 metres. 5390, thank you very much. We are three queens and uh, flaps, 45, so we are set for approach, but make it please very gentle. Yes, I will indeed. You are number one traffic. If you think about it, all the airline pilot training is done with two pilots, uh, both compass mentors in the cockpit, one flying the aeroplane and the other one doing all the emergency drills. So what you actually had was the captain hanging out the window, at least one person hanging onto his legs, and Alistair flying the aeroplane with nobody else to talk to. It's nine miles from touchdown, you're clear to land. Wind indicates zero two zero degrees at one four knots. Descent to height to one five for zero zero feet. QFE is one zero one seven. Roger, sir, descending to 1,500 feet. Talk me down another way. I need all the help I can get. Roger, you'll be able to stop the aircraft on the runway and evacuate the aircraft on the runway. He must have been about six or seven miles from touchdown. And obviously at that point I kept talking until he was happy he could see the runway. I was happy to continue um, looking out the window and land the aeroplane. Um, at the point he said um, he was visual with the runway, I effectively stopped talking. You need not acknowledge unless requested. It will be an uninterrupted talk down, but feel free to interrupt if you feel you need to. 5390, thank you very much. I have the runway in sight. Thank you, you are clear to land. Wish me to continue with any further information? Negative. Thirty-two minutes after takeoff, with 81 terrified passengers, a nearly full fuel tank, and the captain blasted out of the window, Alistair Acheson attempts the most difficult landing of his career. At 8.55 a.m., flight BA-5390 makes a perfect landing at Southampton Airport. Immediately, emergency vehicles surround the plane. Firefighters remove the body of the captain and lead the passengers and crew away.
Alistair Acheson has carried out a remarkable piece of flying, almost unprecedented in aviation history. He has had to pilot his plane without his captain, who has undergone physical stresses that nobody could have been expected to survive. I think these extreme conditions, no one expects to occur in their lifetime. His survival time must have been measured in no more than tens of minutes as he became colder and colder and his body systems began to shut down. Tim Lancaster's body was subjected to a two-pronged assault. The physical violence that his body suffered being blown out of the plane and the extreme cold and lack of oxygen at 17,000 feet. Every thousand feet of altitude causes the temperature to drop by two degrees centigrade. So the temperature on the outside of the plane would have been around minus 17 degrees centigrade. The extreme wind chill also meant his body was losing heat very rapidly. He would have lapsed into semi-consciousness and then unconsciousness, uh, and as the temperature, his core body temperature fell, he would have uh, finally died as a result of uh, the, the ex excessive cold in that environment. Despite the trauma that Captain Lancaster's body suffered, there was one final twist to his story. I've ever been here, and that was 10 yeah. years ago, 15 years In ago. the Oxfordshire yeah. countryside, John Heward and Nigel Ogden are visiting one of their crew members who shared their horrific experiences. Here he is. Hi, guys. John, how are you? Nice to see you. Nice to see you, mate. Nigel. Come in, come in. Hi. Like an SCP, when you go in and you've got to pretend... The captain of that fateful flight, Tim Lancaster, somehow survived his horrific ordeal. There were no fatalities on BA-5390. Yeah, that's it now, you can go on the three-day cruise across there. As his frozen, lifeless body was removed from the plane, nobody thought that Tim could have survived such punishment. But remarkably, he was slowly beginning to emerge from his horrific adventure. Tim, can you hear me? I regained some consciousness on the ground at Southampton because uh, I remember big red and white things, which were obviously fire engines and ambulances, not people and not conversation. And then my next uh, clear, lucid thoughts were in hospital in Southampton. Over the next few days, all the bits eventually arrived back in my sort of consciousness and I put the jigsaw together and, uh, you know, sort of played the whole story for myself. And... Uh, understood what had happened. There was a big bang, a noise of all the air escaping, but I remember watching the windscreen move away from the aircraft and then it had gone like a bullet, it disappeared into the, into the distance. And I think there was an even bigger bang, or there was an even bigger bang. And I was very conscious of going upwards. And, uh, well, the whole thing became completely surreal then, as it would. And uh, I was aware of being outside of the aeroplane, but uh, it didn't, that really didn't bother me a great deal. What I remember most clearly is the fact I couldn't breathe because I was facing into the airflow. And I turned it round and actually turned my body round. I was sort of looking back along the top of the aircraft at that stage and I, I could breathe then. And yes, I, I remember that. I can remember seeing the tail of the aircraft. I can remember the engines going round. And, uh, and then I don't remember much more. Memory stopped at that point. I went down there last year, yeah. but they've changed the airport. Uh, totally, uh, this, yeah. I'm glad I did hold on, because uh, Tim was alive. I mean, he's a very strong man. He must have been, to survive that. I wouldn't have been able to survive it. It is, isn't it? Tim Lancaster's survival was little short of miraculous. He'd been minutes away from death. It was Alistair Acheson's flying that saved his life. His quick thinking in getting the plane to the ground in only 22 minutes saved Lancaster from dying from the effects of exposure. And by pure chance, the physical trauma he suffered was limited. It included a bone fracture in his right arm and wrist, a broken left thumb, 
bruising, frostbite and shock. Remarkably, within five months, Tim Lancaster had made a full recovery and was flying again. Of course, the captain wasn't the only one to go through a horrific experience. Battling with the controls whilst a tornado raged through the cockpit was something no commercial pilot could be trained for. The few pilots who are able to understand the experience of Atchison and his crew include these young Royal Air Force trainees. They are being put through a simulation of an explosive decompression in this hypobaric chamber. The atmospheric pressure is initially set to 8,000 feet. This is the pressure inside the sealed cabin of most commercial aircraft. Anyone can survive this for many hours with no ill effects. Any higher than that, and the experience is very different. Stand by for rapid decompression. In five, four, three, two, one, now. The mist in the hyperbaric chamber is identical to the fog formed when the window blew out on BA 5390. At the instant of rapid decompression, the air in the cabin can no longer hold onto its water vapor, which is then released into the atmosphere as fog. Seven and eight. Once the fog clears, then the lack of oxygen at that height begins to tell. Without oxygen, at first we begin to see uh, a reduction in their reaction speed. We see increasingly impaired performance in our students. Thinking is slowed and their reaction speed becomes increasingly slowed until they begin to develop sort of uh, lapses of concentration, uh, falling into uh, unconsciousness and finally death if uh, their oxygen supply is not re-established. Flying alone, battling nearly 400 mile an hour winds and defeating the possibility of oxygen deprivation, Alistair Atchison's achievement in saving Flight 5390 was outstanding. Even as the crisis was unfolding, accident investigators were rushing to Southampton to find an explanation. On the ground at Southampton Airport, the search for clues begins. Initial investigation shows no distortion to the frame of the windscreen, so this rules out a problem with the structure. The fact that there are no shards of glass also discounts a bird strike. Stuart Culling, senior investigator with the Air Accident Investigation Branch, has little to go on. The windscreen was missing. There was a certain amount of blood around. There were some minor dents and scrapes on the fuselage, as you'd expect if the window had gone past. And really, that was about it, apart from a lot of paper scattered around inside. One of his first clues comes from the log recovered from the plane. He knows the plane had been serviced just the day before and that a windscreen had been replaced. He immediately pays a visit to the British Airways maintenance hangar at Birmingham. I wanted to find out exactly what had happened to the aircraft before it took off. And I'd arranged that I should talk to the shift maintenance man who fitted the, the window. Uh, there was a, a slight problem there because he'd been on night duty and consequently he had finished his shift at roughly the same time as the windscreen came out of the aircraft and he wasn't in a fit state to be interviewed. He needed to get some sleep. Stuart Culling. Good yeah. morning. Good to yes. see you. I was expecting you. Yes, good. Yes, thank, thank you very much. Is this the uh, hangar in question? This is the main hangar. Yes. 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 So in the meantime, I, I, I looked around the facility. Uh, I, to... I made sure that any paperwork and any records of the aircraft had been identified and taken away so they couldn't be accessed by anyone else and waited until he came in. Hello, I'm from the AIIB. Yes, and this is my colleague. What I'd like to do today is just find out what went on that, uh, during that shift pattern and, okay. and how it went. Thank you very much. 
Did you notice uh, anything about the window itself, any uh, stress marks that were worrying you? My first conversation with the chief maintenance manager was relatively general, because at that stage we had no evidence that was relevant. Uh, you didn't delegate it to somebody else and then no, check Stuart, it? Stuart, there's oh. a phone call for you, just come in. Oh, right. Uh, would you mind if I took this and uh, well, come back? So I took the call and found that it was information about the windscreen which had been found near Didcot, and there were something like 30 bolts found with it, most of which were one size short in diameter, one size too small in diameter. It was a crucial error. On some planes, windscreens are fitted from the inside and use the internal pressure inside the cabin to keep them in place. But on the 111, the windscreen is bolted on from the outside. Any weakness in the bolts could mean that the pressure inside the plane would blow the windscreen out. It appears Culling has very quickly found the mistake and the guilty man. Um, I've had some news which I think is very relevant. I've heard from my colleagues who are working on the bolts. They tell me they're the wrong bolts. They're the wrong diameter. Um, no, that's not possible. They're the, exactly the same bolts that I took out of there. Um, He's a professional man. He's very keen on doing things to his mind uh, in the interests of the company. And he's suddenly told that he's put a windscreen in using bolts of the wrong size. And he's absolutely, he's, he's absolutely shocked. Um, I can show you. I can show you the bolts I got out of there. One thing that came out was that he said, oh, the old bolts went into a waste bin in the hangar where he did the job, and they may still be there. So we rushed across to the waste bin and found something like 80 discarded bolts. Yeah. They'll be in here. This is where I put them. These are the, these are the bolts. And these are the ones you checked against the new ones? That's right. Yeah, I took from the carousel. It was really excellent evidence. Gold, as far as I was concerned. Well, I'll take these away. OK. By comparing the maintenance manual to what the engineer had told him, Culling is quickly able to identify the first part of the sequence, what went wrong the previous night when the window of the BAC-111 had been replaced. We went through the whole chain of events that had occurred, and we found that uh, there were something like 13 different anomalies which um, led to the fitting of the bolts. And had any of these caused him to think, the sequence of events would not have continued and there wouldn't have been an accident. The engineer had come early into his shift and at about 4 a.m. had gone to work removing the old windscreen from the plane. The hangar was full and the plane had been pushed against the hangar door, which made the windscreen hard to reach. Stretched across the fuselage, he had problems controlling his screwdriver. The windscreen that he had taken out had itself been fitted with the wrong length bolts, but they were still strong enough to hold the screen in, and it survived without a hitch for four years. But he was a conscientious engineer, and he decided that he would replace the old bolts with new ones when he installed the new screen. He chose not to go to the parts catalogue and look up the exact bolts he needed. Instead, he went straight to the parts store. Good morning. Morning. There, he matched by eye new bolts with the ones he had taken out of the screen. His eye match was good, and he found a few fresh bolts of exactly the same type in a drawer. Uh, what I'm after is I need 97 days. I'm just doing a windscreen on a 111 over there, and I need some new bolts. Eight days on a 111? Well, no, these are sevens. This is a seven. I've just taken it out. We haven't got any sevens anyway. OK. Right, the I'll store manager knew that. which bolts the engineer should have been That's looking for, buy. but the engineer chose to ignore his advice. Instead, he drove to the other side of the airport to find a match for his bolts. It was now about 5.15 a.m., and in a dark corner of the hangar, he continued to search for new bolts identical to the ones he'd taken out of the plane. But in the gloom, his luck finally ran out. He thought they matched, but they didn't. He picked bolts that were just over two hundredths of an inch too narrow for the job.
Returning to the 111, he stretched over the plane and began fitting these new bolts. Working at an angle, he couldn't see that the new bolts didn't fit correctly. Signing off at 6 a.m., the engineer had managed to get his work done in time. The plane was now ready to be handed over to Captain Lancaster and his crew. In fact, it was a disaster waiting to happen. The morning of the next day, the 111 was at 17,300 feet. The difference in pressure between the sealed hull of the jet and the thin atmosphere was climbing quickly to the half ton per square foot it would reach at 35,000 feet. This pressure was looking for a weakness, and it found it. For Culling, finding out what had happened that night is only the first step. No one had hidden from him what they'd done, but he knows that he has to go deeper to understand the reasons behind this horrific sequence of events, why the engineer did what he did, and whether this was an isolated incident or the symptom of a bigger problem. Accident investigation, certainly on aircraft, comprises two parts. The first part is what's happened, and, and that's usually relatively the easy bit. Um, the second part is why did it happen? Why did the engineer ignore procedure, bypass the technical manuals, and ignore helpful advice? Culling's search for the answers was in its own way revolutionary. If we talk to people without giving them a warning, um, we felt we'd get more information because they'd, they'd be freer to discuss it. If we gave them a formal caution, as it were, we thought that uh, they would dry up. Coffee? Uh, yes, please. Great. How is the journey in? Oh, well, usual stuff. They decide to talk to the engineer well away from the hangar in a cosy hotel room. Well, thanks for coming in. To gain insight into the methods of the maintenance engineers, Culling then does something no one had done before. He brings in a behavioural psychologist. Is the aircraft normally in the hangar when you're doing that? Psychologists have been used before to analyse why pilots make mistakes under pressure. It's a discipline called human factors. But in 1990, using human factors in engineering was unheard of. I wanted a, a professional slant on what is really psychological territory. I would hope that as far as the uh, shift maintenance manager was concerned, that it gave him extra confidence that we were trying to be even-handed and that we were trying to get to the bottom of it. Uh, the, uh, you know, the parts catalogue. Um, uh, when, you, uh, when you get the bolts out, um, do you go straight to the parts catalogue or do you just sort of... Um... Not usually. Uh, right. No, I, if I've got a set of screws, uh, the same screws, I, I just go get them up. Uh, right. Uh, you, you, you find it's easier to do it visually. It was, in that case, easier to do it visually from the bolts you take now. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. they're, they're the same bolts that come out, the same ones go back in, so yeah. same size yeah. bolts, there's no difference. And if it worked before, it must be the right bolts. Yeah, it's time. just replacing like with like, really. Yeah, because it had been flying. We were somewhat horrified that they had... that they had admitted those things to us because after all, we were officially in inverted commas, and they were quite proud of them. We would have thought that had they used such practices, they, they would have kept very quiet about it. If I'd had to go check with the computers what bolts I needed and what parts and how to fit the thing, then there was a good chance it wouldn't have been flying at the time it was meant to be. Good, good. So when you're doing the job now you're an experienced engineer. Uh, it might not be by the book all the time, like you would train somebody who was new. No, uh, we've been doing these things for years. Culling was stunned by what he was hearing, but there were more revelations to come. The engineer's dangerous approach was becoming clearer by the minute. You trusted your own knowledge better than the store supervisor's knowledge. Well, I'm an engineer. I got seven D bolts out, so I put seven D bolts back in. That's, well, you know, no problem with that. It's that simple. So you trusted that 
the aircraft had been flying, so therefore they must have been the right bolts. Uh, yeah, that, that aircraft did lots of hours with that windscreen. Their whole aim was to expedite work through the uh, through their station. They had a lot of work coming. It was all done at night, and in many cases they had more work than they could reasonably handle. And they had devised little stratagems to to get round that. Culling and the psychologists' insights made their way into the first draft of the report. It said that there were systemic faults in the maintenance procedure in Birmingham. But under pressure from British Airways lawyers, and because they hadn't carried out their investigation following normal procedure, the final report was forced to change its emphasis. Our, by our, I mean the Treasury solicitor or whoever was advising the branch, um, confirmed that uh, under natural law it was it was unfair to use that information because we hadn't gone through the whole procedure. And so we, we had to remove that from the report. The investigators had never produced an accident report like it. Working with the psychologist, Culling developed a completely novel way of using human factors to explain why this accident happened. They uncovered pressures in the hangar that caused an otherwise proficient engineer to make potentially lethal mistakes whilst being certain he was doing the right thing. This psychological approach took air accident prevention to a new level. Through the sheer skill of the crew of BA5390, as well as a small measure of luck, 87 people are now still alive. As a consequence of this investigation, others may never have to go through the same ordeal. In the aftermath of the accident, the crew were treated as heroes. They received numerous awards, and Alistair Acheson received the coveted gold medal for airmanship. Their colleagues also showed what they felt. One of the most moving things was to go back to Birmingham. As we walked into the airport, the whole of the airport stopped. And all the ground staff and all the checking girls and all that just stood and applauded as we walked through the building. And it was, it was really quite, you know, moving at the time. You sort of wanted to get out of the way so that you could sort of, you know, I don't really want to do this. It's like walking up the red carpet sort of thing. No. <laughs> Their colleagues were applauding a team which had demonstrated the highest form of professionalism at every level. A cabin crew which worked as a team in extraordinary circumstances, and the co-pilot, an outsider who took control and worked alone to bring them all safely down to earth. Each of the crew dealt with their experience in different ways. Tim Lancaster began flying again with BA just five months after the accident. He's retired from BA, but loves flying so much he's now with another airline. You cannot say that. <laughs> She'll shoot you. It was a special day when I, the first day I flew. It, I decided, you know, that was what I was going to do. I was going to make an effort to go back to work and get better. So having made the decision, the rest was easy. For Nigel, the man who ran to Tim's aid and held on to him for dear life, the impact of that day was far more profound. I think about it every day. And that is the truth. I think about it every single day. In one form or another, yeah. Every single day. Uh, it'll affect me till the end of my days. Mm. Nigel, along with Simon and Sue, no longer fly. But John Hewitt is still with British Airways as a chief steward. But even he isn't free of the memories of that day. They were bringing in a, a, another British Aerospace aeroplane to, to where I worked in Birmingham, and uh, unfortunately, that window was fitted from the outside, and the layout of the cabin was identical. And when I sat on it, it all came back to you. Um, but for that reason, I've gone back to work at Heathrow and fly long-haul flights again, because those aeroplanes have got no resemblance to the 111 at all. Alistair Acheson, who is still flying for British Airways, chose not to take part in this film. For each of the crew, the experience will stay with them in different ways. But common to them all is that on that day, their numbers did not come up. Tim explained it very well, actually. And he said, our names were on the page, but we weren't at the top. 
And I think that was, you know, probably true.